Hello horse racing fans, we all know race horses are fast and that they can have big personalities. Some race horses melt our hearts with their gentle souls and others are just crazy. That's what we're going to focus on today, racing's biggest and wackiest personalities. Now the list of crazy race horses I came up with was bigger than any of my other videos, going to show just how full of personality horses are. Because of this, I have to split this video into two parts. The first half will cover horses from the 19th and 20th centuries, and part two will focus on the modern crazy horses. So without further ado, let's get started. One of the most important sires in racing history, St. Simon was perfect on the racetrack, winning all nine of his official races and an unofficial trial race with ease. But St. Simon's perfect record is dwarfed by his influence, with Niarco and by extension Northern Dancer directly descending from him. And thus, many modern racehorses can be traced back to St. Simon if you go back far enough. But that isn't why he's in this video. He was amazing to be sure, but he was also a bit electric. He could be handled by a brave and patient person, but not everyone is like that. Enough grooms were savaged by St. Simon that people still recount this part of him over a hundred years after his death. But the grooms seem to be the lucky ones, compared to his main victims, cats. For some reason, St. Simon wasn't a cat person, or cat horse in this case. St. Simon might have savaged grooms, but he killed barn cats. Oddly, he's not the only famous sire who was known to kill small animals, with Danzig and Halo both being said to kill birds, but no other stallion was said to kill cats. Usually, horses and cats actually get along pretty well, as seen with Run Happy and Sancho, but St. Simon was different. Was there anything else he hated? Yes. Umbrellas. It's safe to say everyone watching this video knows who Man of War is, a nearly perfect horse with a shiny red coat and equally fiery personality. His temperament being high strung, willful, but fiercely intelligent. Not a brute, but someone who commanded respect. But that's not who we're talking about today. We're going to talk about his way meaner grandsire, Hastings, a much more poorly behaved animal than his grandkid, with not nearly as much to admire. He ran the same amount of times as Man of War, with 21 career starts, but half as many victories. He still did take the 1896 Belmont Stakes, and won as a four-year-old carrying 140 pounds, more weight than even Man of War had to carry, and brushed shoulders with the best horses of the time. It was a productive career to be sure, that was nothing short of a miracle to have lasted so long. While he was already hard to manage in his youth, his temper aged like fine milk. By his four-year-old season, despite racing the most he ever would at 12 times, he fought every step of the way, throwing tantrums when he was being saddled and taking every ounce of strength from exercise riders to control him during workouts. The best example coming from Man of War's future trainer, Louis Foistel. Along with training the great Man of War, he raised his sire Fairplay and trained his dam Mahuba. But when he was 13 years old, he was first introduced to the family through the grandsire Hastings. It was supposed to be an easy half a mile breeze, they said. Hastings turned it into a two mile hell ride. And when the smoke cleared, Louis was told that he would never ride that horse again. There was no hard feelings. By the time Louis had gotten to Man of War, he knew exactly what to expect temperament-wise, but still got so much more. But now back to Hastings. When he was finally retired from racing, he was so irritable, people wouldn't touch him with a six-foot pole. Literally. Anyone who worked at Nursery Stud entered his paddock armed with a long stick. One specific anecdote described him trying to attack a stable boy, but slipping and missing his target. Eventually, a ramp was made so people could interact with him as little as possible. He did pay them back, becoming the leading sire in North America twice, the highlight of course being Fair Play, who then creates the Mostus Horse. Fair Play didn't just have one good son in Man of War. He produced other good horses, such as Display. Display was a lot like his grandsire, a bad actor before races. His pre-race antics were legendary, one of the big things he's remembered for a century after his birth. While details are scarce on him, what can be pieced together is best summarized as Display was a natural-born leader who hated being forced 
to man's will. With no starting gates at the time, Display had to deal with the rough hands of the starting crews, trying to keep half-ton racehorses still long enough for a fair standing start. It's not very surprising he became a horse who hated standing still and being controlled by humans, gladly dragging multiple handlers for 10 minutes at a time before the start of the race. Although his regular rivals were not considered saintly either, Display managed to be the most infamous during a time where it was considered normal for horses to delay races with poor behavior. Even with all this abject defiance and bitterness towards mankind, he was a very sound racehorse, winning 23 of 103 races, highlighted by the 1926 Preakness Stakes and 10 other stakes wins he accumulated over 6 years. He faced and beat every major champion horse in the latter half of the 20s, at least once, defeating every Horse of the Year winner from 1924 to 1928, along with having regular duels with more forgotten champions, like 1926 Traverse Stakes winner Mars, who he beat 4-3. Although, the tiny but mighty horse Peanuts always had his number, beating him 6-1. A brilliant career for a racehorse, but if he had been treated better, who knows what he could have done. He was given the very common but oh-so-deserved nickname of the Iron Horse, a title of appreciation that he sadly never felt. If he had a reason to hate humanity when he was racing, he certainly did when he went to stud, being confined to a small boarded-up paddock with chains on his feet and a muzzle on his mouth, hardly being treated like royalty in years off the track. But he was a good sire, producing many sound racehorses, highlighted by Hall of Famer and incredible weight carrier Discovery. Although he was a successful racehorse and stud, I can't help but feel bad for Display, and sympathize with why he could have become such a bitter horse. To summarize Whirl Away in one sentence, would be when his own trainer described him with the adjectives stupid and brilliant. That was Whirly for ya. Probably one of the most talented racehorses ever to exist, with the only thing that could defeat him being, well, himself. Especially in his early races, which he would still win in spite of giving himself many major handicaps, such as breaking slowly and giving his opponents head starts, and his infamous habit of drifting to the far outside, which frightened and overpowered most jockeys. But trainer Ben Jones didn't give up on the smart idiot horse. The story of Ben trying to get Whirl Away to run in a straight line is a classic horse racing tale. A horse won't go where he can't see is an old classic training quote. So Ben tested it by forcing Whirly to only see the inside rail, cutting off Whirl Away's left blinker cup but keeping his right blinker almost completely sealed. Quite extreme to have your racehorse be blind in one eye. But, Ben was adamant, and to finally prove it, Ben stood on his lead pony with a small opening between him and the rail. Jockey Eddie Arcaro would be forced to ride Whirly through the hole. Whirl Away was one of the few horses that ever scared the legendary jockey, but if Ben was brave enough to sit on that pony, then he had to be brave enough to go between them. Turns out, Ben was correct, and Whirly made it through no problem, en route to winning the Triple Crown and even the Traverse Stakes, four races never won by the same horse ever again. Although the only thing most people know about his career afterward was his losses to Al Sab, as a four-year-old, he still won 12 of 22 races and was never worse than third, retiring with 32 wins from 60 starts, the most races run by an American Triple Crown winner. The only thing longer than his list of victories was his tail, famously left uncut, used as a defensive tail fan to intimidate horses from passing him and giving him his other nickname of Mr. Longtail. He was the total package, gorgeous to look at, emphatic in running style, and of course, totally crazy. Whenever anyone brings up badly behaved stallions, the worst that comes to mind is Halo, a horse who couldn't have had a more inaccurate name. Halo's influence is only equaled by his horror stories, producing many great progeny, including two Kentucky Derby winners, highlighted by Sunday Silence, who also won the Preakness, the Breeders' Cup Classic, and became the most influential sire in Japan, making Halo a forefather to almost every great Japanese racehorse. But on the other hand, he drowned birds in his water bucket, or snatched them out of the sky, and attacked many grooms. The worst part of his attacks was that he was creative. He bit one groom on the arm and shook it like a ragdoll, breaking it in three places. He picked up another by the shirt and then chomped his stomach until it was purple. And then they gave him an aluminum muzzle, thinking that would stop him from biting people. 
It did, but instead he would use it as a bludgeon, turning his face into a makeshift hammer as he smashed it down on people's heads. Oh, and I forgot to mention, he was also apparently a racist! Although I personally think he just hated everything with a pulse. You gotta wonder what creates such a monster. For one, pedigree, and a rake. When he was a young racehorse, he had a groom who hit him with a rake to keep him away. This helped spark the beast inside Halo, terrorizing rivals with wins in top-tier races like the United Nations Handicap, and then attacking anything that moved when he retired. His hatred fueled him, with his groom saying that he was, quote, too mean to die, living till the age of 31. Even by then, he wore a halter that had stayed on his face for years, because no one wanted to go into the pasture and take it off. What a legacy to leave behind. In 1978, a gelding named Boldaboy won a race called the Albernant Stakes. It was the fourth time he had won the race, a historic feat no one had ever done before or since. But in second place that day was a pink hooded horse named Yuba Dizzy, a talented sprinter in his own right that had a major dark side. He was already considered an ill-tempered horse, but after the Albernant, he became immortalized. While being unsaddled, he was hungry. Not for hay or sugar cubes, but for human flesh. So he decided to eat his groom, a moment in time preserved by this disturbing photograph. Following this incident, Yuba Dizzy would never be allowed to race in Britain. Ironically, his favorite victim wasn't the target of Yuba Dizzy's most infamous outburst. Andy Crook, a man who later trained Scottish national winner Raya Lux. He started as a groom and jockey for Yuba Dizzy, where the horse would give him hell. Tearing off his trousers, shirts, and an inch off his left ring finger. But Andy would learn to ride him to victory, mostly by staying out of his way. But they split up after his ban from Britain being sold for 8,000 guineas as a six-year-old to continue his career elsewhere. He would make multiple stops in other countries, but the highlight was in out of all places, Sweden, where he was crowned champion sprinter of 1979. Underneath all that ferocity was a talented racehorse, but these wins were not enough to take a bite out of his reputation. He will always be remembered as the horse who tried to eat a person. 1998 was an amazing year for horse racing, with lots of superstars. Real Quiet coming closer than any horse had in 20 years to winning the Triple Crown. But there were still people who thought another horse was the best three-year-old of 98. And it wasn't Victory Gallop. It was a horse who didn't run in any of the Triple Crown races. That was Coronado's Quest. What kept him off the Triple Crown were a few things, but the biggest one was his behavior giving him the nickname of Racing's Bad Boy in the first half of the season. He was a horrible paddock actor, despising being saddled, throwing off jockey Mike Smith more than once. Despite many articles highlighting his freakouts in his three Goldstream Park Derby preps, those closest to him had plenty of faith. Mike Smith went on record saying that he trusted the horse and knew that he never intentionally tried to hurt him. Trainer Shug McGahee was similarly optimistic, confident that he had figured out a major source of his issues. Only a few days after a disappointing performance in the Florida Derby, Coronado's quest went under surgery to fix an entrapped epiglottis. While other injuries prevented him from participating in the Triple Crown, he won three Grade 2 races in New York. The streak peaked at five wins, concluding with two Grade 1s the Haskell, and then the Travers in a three-horse photo finish, which included Belmont winner Victory Gallop. But he flattened out in his final three races, finishing no better than fourth against world beaters like Skip Away, Silver Charm, Awesome Again, Freehouse, etc, etc. And that takes us up to the 21st century, and sets the stage for part two, where thanks to the power of the internet, crazy racehorses get a stage other than the racetrack to display their quirky personalities. We'll talk about favorites such as Fusaiichi Pegasus, Point Given, Goldship, and plenty of other wackadoodles in part two of Crazy Racehorses.